Welcome to another episode of China Update, where I provide you with the most up-to-date political, economic, and geostrategic analysis on the world's number two economy. My name is Tony. Let's jump in. Happy Friday, everybody. I hope you had a productive week, and I wish you all a restful weekend ahead. First up, we need to start with Taiwan. Today, in an exclusive report, UK-based The Financial Times reports that Taiwan's foreign policy officials have made a secret trip to the Greater Washington area for talks with the U.S. The first such visit since President Lai Qingde took office in May. Foreign Minister Lin and Joseph Wu, Taiwan's national security adviser, have been in the Washington area this week for the talks that are known as the Special Channel, according to several people familiar with the visit speaking to the outlet. The U.S. and Taiwan have held the Special Channel talks for years, but their existence was first disclosed by the Financial Times in 2021, when the two sides, including Wu, who was then foreign minister, met in Maryland. The channel is seen as a rare opportunity for a larger group of senior officials from both sides to hold detailed talks. The report explains that under a long-standing practice, Taiwan's foreign minister and defense minister cannot enter the District of Columbia, so the channel has usually been held in the greater Washington area. The channel comes at a sensitive time as China watches to see how Lai will handle relations with Beijing and Washington. As regular viewers know, Beijing has described Lai as a dangerous separatist and worries that he is more likely to take steps towards official independence than his predecessor, Tsai Ing-wen. Interestingly, the Financial Times piece writes, quote, Some U.S. officials are also privately nervous about Lai, who is inexperienced in foreign affairs and seen as more unpredictable than Tsai. End quote. Evan Medeiros, a China expert at Georgetown University and former top White House Asia advisor, said the special channel was, quote, one of the most sensitive and important mechanisms in global politics today. The meeting comes at a critical time given Taiwan's recent election. Clear and consistent communication between Taipei and Washington is essential, especially as People's Republic of China pressure grows, end quote. Veteran China analyst Bill Bishop expressed on the report, quote, I highly doubt the PRC was unaware of these meetings, but once they are made public, it will have to at least dial up the rhetorical response, if not also show displeasure through increased activity around Taiwan. End quote. Meanwhile, this week is part of uh, an initiative championed by the Interparliamentary Alliance on China, IPAC, the Australia Senate, passed a motion rejecting Beijing's interpretation of the United Nations General Assembly Resolution 2758, the 1971 resolution replacing Taiwan, that is the Republic of China, with the PRC, the People's Republic of China, as a member of the United Nations. The Australian Senate unanimously passed the urgency motion, which, quote, firmly rejects Beijing's misinterpretation of the resolution and international law regarding Taiwan's status. End quote. Senator Debra O'Neill stated with the passing, quote, Taiwan is a leading Indo-Pacific democracy and an important partner for Australia. We share with Taiwan a commitment to an open, inclusive and stable Indo-Pacific. End quote. This motion follows the launch of the 2758 initiative at IPAC Taipei 2024, where delegates pledge to pass similar resolutions in their own parliaments, quote, to reject China's distortion of UN Resolution 2758 and to support Taiwan's claims for meaningful participation in UN agencies and beyond, end quote. Of course, Beijing is not happy about this at all. Officials, scholars and state media organs have already condemned these efforts. This legal argument was most robustly articulated by Bonnie Glasser, an American scholar on China and managing director of the German Marshall Fund's Indo-Pacific program. This week's state-run Global Times published yet another piece attacking Glaser, writing, quote, As a scholar, Glaser's feigned ignorance and wanton distortion of legal historical facts is bound to raise the question of whether she lacks academic common sense. However, considering that her report was authorized and funded by the DPP authorities, the underlying intentions are clear. The Glacier Report seeks to raise the dregs of the theory of the undermined status of Taiwan, but also provides academic packaging for the sophistry. This is obviously not the appropriate behavior of scholars with a conscience. 
End quote. Next up, new data show that Chinese firms are stockpiling chip-making equipment and supplies ahead of possible new U.S. restrictions, a possibility we have been following closely for several weeks now. As we have also followed, Chinese technology giant Huawei has been trying to build its fab network out as quickly as possible. However, this is very expensive and difficult. And in the meantime, China still must import the most advanced chip making equipment. The US has been tightening rules that would restrict China's progress in critical technologies, including semiconductors and AI. Those measures include repeated rounds of export controls, limiting the sale of advanced chips and equipment capable of making those components. U.S. outlet Bloomberg writes that Chinese imports of equipment to make semiconductors hit a record for the first seven months of this year. According to fresh data released by China's General Administration of Customs this week, Chinese firms imported almost 26 billion U.S. dollars worth of chip-making machinery. It surpassed the previous high mark in 2021 and comes as America Japanese and Dutch officials work on increasing restrictions on Chinese companies. Chinese purchases from firms such as Tokyo Electron Limited, ASML Holdings and Applied Materials Inc. have soared in the past year. During the period, Chinese companies bought more lower-end equipment after the US and its allies tightened controls on their access to the most cutting-edge technology. That spending spree has helped drive Dutch exports to China to new heights, exceeding two billion US dollars in July for only the second time on record. Dutch company ASML sales to China surged 21% in the second quarter to hit almost half of its total revenue, with sales consisting of unrestricted older systems as Beijing pushes to make more mature types of semiconductors. In June, trade group SEMI estimated that Chinese chip makers are now expected to grow their output by 14% to 10.1 million wafers per month in 2025, or nearly a third of the global industry's production. Next up, we have two more important developments to cover, but just quickly, if you're getting some value from today's episode, don't forget to hit the like button. Liking, sharing, and subscribing are huge helps for the channel. It's the only way in which the algorithm will push the channel to new viewers. Patreon and Buy Me Coffee links are also in the description for those who want to help keep the channel financially sustainable. Thank you so much, everybody, for the ongoing support. A game backed by Tencent Holdings Limited, developed by Chinese developer Game Science in Hangzhou, China. I actually used to live about 10 minutes walk from their offices has quickly become one of the most popular games ever on Steam just hours after its release, representing China's first successful AAA title. The action-adventure game Black Myth Wukong, inspired by the legendary Monkey King of the Journey to the West, attracted over 2.1 million concurrent players during its global debut on Tuesday. This number exceeded the launch day peaks of other high-profile single-player games like Cyberpunk 2077 and Elden Ring. This strong debut suggests that China's 40 billion US dollar gaming industry might be rebounding after years of strict regulatory oversight. Wei Sun Ling, managing director at UBP, expressed on the news, quote, This could inspire more AAA game development for PC and consoles. Chinese regulators might also become more supportive of such game development for export. End quote. Daniel Ahmed, a senior analyst at Nico Partners, observed, quote, The game's success demonstrates that Chinese developers have the capability to create AAA games and compete with Western studios on the global stage. End quote. The game has been both a commercial and critical success, too, with global reviews being quite positive, noting only minor issues with localization, gameplay, and console performance. While Tencent's stock remained relatively stable in Hong Kong trading, smaller companies linked to the game saw their stocks surge. Huayi Brothers Media Corp shares jumped by the 20% limit in Shenzhen, primarily due to its direct stake in game science. Unsurprisingly, state media trumpeted the success of the game and used it as an opportunity to wave the patriotic flag. Feng Ji, one of the founders of Game Science, gave a video interview for a domestic audience across state media, some of which may raise eyebrows internationally, with him at one point expressing, quote, We represent the deep love everyone has for this country and for our race. End quote. 
And finally for today, this week, Lynette H. Ung, Senior Fellow on Chinese Society at the Center for China Analysis at the U.S.-based Asia Society Policy Institute, published a report for the Asia Society called The Weakest Link in China's Debt-Fueled Growth Model. Chinese indebted rural banks carry social consequences beyond their size. To end today's video, we will examine some of this report, which we are now quoting selected excerpts from directly. China's property sector crisis, set off by Xi Jinping's three red lines policy, has taken a huge toll on the economy since late 2020. Property has occupied a dominant position in China's debt-fueled growth model in the past two decades, taking up anywhere between 23 and 30 percent of the economy. To stimulate GDP growth, local governments use land as collateral and set up local government financing vehicles to borrow heavily from banks and promote urbanization and property development. Well-connected property developers purchase parcels of land at favorable rates from local governments, and in return they invest in infrastructure in those localities, which then benefit local economies. Local governments also make money off land sales and tax revenues from construction and other business activities from new property development. During the era of China's rapid growth, when local government officials were promoted based on their local GDP performance, this seemed like a win-win model. Until we asked the question, where did all the money come from? The money that fueled China's rapid urbanization and frenzied construction came largely from ordinary folks. The household depositors who parked their lifetime savings at Chinese banks and retail investors who bought sophisticated wealth management products that promised high returns, only to realize that their monies were thrown into risky property projects that, in more recent years, started generating negative returns. Essentially, the rapid expansion of the once almighty property sector was funded by household savings. This debt fuel growth model worked as long as there was money flowing as it did in the past two decades, until Xi's imposition of the three red lines that abruptly constrained the cheap loans extended to property developers made possible by household savings that were underpriced. When the money flows or proverbial musical chairs suddenly stopped around 2021, many players found themselves without a seat. The weakest link in the financial sector are the approximately 3,800 small and medium-sized regional banks, including city commercial banks, rural commercial banks, township and village banks, which are more vulnerable than the larger ones, with combined assets of 55 trillion yuan, 7.5 trillion US dollars, they account for 13% of the total banking assets. Now, as a quick aside, according to China's own National Financial Regulatory Administration, the sector could be even bigger. Just this week, the National Financial Regulatory Administration, in a report, explained that as of the end of June, there were 3,830 small and medium-sized banks nationwide, with assets reaching 115 trillion yuan, over 15 trillion US dollars, accounting for almost a third of the total assets of the entire banking industry. We return to quoting the Asia Society piece. In particular, the smaller rural banks are most vulnerable because they can only absorb savings from local depositors and are thus less financially diversified. Banking regulations bar them from establishing branches or offering online services to clients registered outside their home provinces. Due to their strong ties to local governments, they tend to lead to government-related projects, which renders their financial viability largely determined by the strength of their local economies. Since the beginning of 2024, more than 60 of these rural banks have been dissolved or merged. These smaller banks have become the exception to the continued robustness of the Chinese banking institutions despite their liquidity issues. The system has not experienced a meltdown because the central government's socialist system can instruct state-owned enterprises and entities to absorb bad assets by dictates. Evergrande, the first property developer that became insolvent, has a total debt of 300 billion US dollars, the size of Finland's GDP. Despite the massive indebtedness of property conglomerates and enormous local government debt estimated between 55 and 75 percent of the country's GDP, China's financial sector has not yet come under severe stress. However, since 2019, bank runs have occurred 
in some of the smaller banks. In 2022, when a group of depositors with the village and township banks in Henan discovered they could no longer withdraw their deposits, they staged a protest at the Provincial People's Bank of China in Zhengzhou, only to be beaten up by plain-clothed security guards. Zhengzhou, the provincial capital of Henan, is among the most notorious cities for unfinished apartment projects, a huge mess created by unscrupulous property developers due to its rapid urbanization during the 2010s. Even though these small lenders constitute only a small proportion of total banking assets in China, bank runs can erode people's faith in the banking system, with ripple effects on social stability. Although the central bank's insurance scheme, which guarantees up to 500,000 yuan of individual deposits, has only existed since 2015, deposits have always carried an implicit guarantee from the central government. There is a deeply held belief among Chinese citizens that all banks belong to the state, that the central government will never let a bank go under, and thus their deposits are guaranteed even in a private bank. This ethos, though difficult to measure, under supported the banking system's stability during times of financial turmoil in the 1990s and 2000s. Seen in this light, it is no surprise that the depositors in Henan organized collective action to defend their rights when they discovered that their savings were dishonored by the rural banks, and when the protesters were rounded up by unidentified security guards, they made international headlines. Their actions carried far more weight and social consequences than the size of the bank's financial assets would foretell. Here ends the direct quote and today's episode of China Update. Thank you so much, everybody, for watching. Have a wonderful Friday. Have a lovely weekend, a restful weekend. And I will see you all tomorrow.